So let's do this quick review. Some main topics that you need to know, um, obviously geologic time, natural selection, those factors of evolution, evidences of evolution, allele frequency, genetic drift, cladograms, and speciation. These are all things that we talked about together, either in class or via video. Um, so these, sh these shouldn't be new topics to you, um, but I just in case I am gonna go ahead and kind of go briefly over each one of them tonight, um, just so you have a refresher and you find out if there's any areas that you need a little extra work on or you need some clarification on, okay? Uh, first is geologic time, all right? I'm not gonna make you memorize the eras or when the extinctions were or anything like that, um, but it is good for you to know that the earth is approximately 4.6 billion years old. Um, sorry, that earth right there, that should be capitalized. Um, there have been several eras of time. Like I said, you don't have to know what they are, but know that they exist. And there have been several mass extinctions. Um, in the scheme of things, really, we're new here, right? Think back to the timeline that we made in class. Think back to how much of that 4.6 meters of that strip of paper you had to color red, and that was before there was a whole lot of anything, life-wise, right? Um, and then all that time had passed, and then where were humans? We're in that tiny little place right at the end. Right? You barely had enough room to label and draw where humans are because we are so new here. Okay? We have a lot of a lot of people have a hard time grasping evolution in general, right? This is the, the token controversial topic. Um, but people don't have the capabilities almost of grasping how much time 4.6 billion years really is. Evolution takes a long time to occur. And if we really all sat down and understood how much time has passed before now, it might be a little bit easier to understand how this process works. All right. Um, first things about natural selection here. Um, natural selection shows us that evolution occurs within a species over time, right? Um, those individual organisms don't evolve. Please understand that. I'm not going to evolve. You are not going to evolve. Species are what evolve, okay? Those species change over periods of time. This happens because the traits that are favorable in that specific environment um, are the ones that allow that organism or that species to survive and then are the ones that thus get passed down in that species. Therefore, they become more common, and over long periods of time and lots and lots of generations, we see a major change, okay? But as an individual, this doesn't happen. Evolution does not occur on an individual basis, period, by definition, okay? Um, organisms that don't have favorable traits, obviously, they're not going to survive, right? Um, and if they don't survive, then they're not alive to reproduce, which means they don't pass those traits down. So that's how those traits then eventually kind of disappear or at least become much less common over time within a species. Okay. Um, if you remember, we spent a day in class talking about the factors of evolution. And there are four main factors that you need to know. We have overproduction, uh, individual variation, struggle for existence, and survival of the fittest. If you remember, overproduction is just the tendency for organisms to have lots and lots and lots of babies, especially in nature. Um, if we're not talking about the top predators, we see that organisms have lots of babies. Remember that picture, right? Of, of all those little naked rat babies or mouse babies or whatever they were um, on the slideshow that we, we looked at in class um, is because just naturally, all of those organisms are not going to make it, right? All of those babies aren't going to survive. So to ensure the ability to pass down traits, lots of babies are had, okay? Um, and that way, if some are lost, there are still some there to carry on that genetic line, right? 
Um, the second one is the individual variation. This is the variety within a species. It helps it going extinct, depending on what it is, right? Is it because um, it's a color difference that makes it more attractive to a mate, therefore it's more likely to reproduce? Or is it something in the genetic code that makes it to where a disease doesn't wipe it out? And so therefore it survives it and is able to pass that down. Whatever it is, there's a lot of different examples, but that variety, that difference between organisms in that species um, kind of strengthens that because it then allows it to survive in lots of different situations. Okay, like not every single organism might make it, but that variety might mean that some of them do and therefore that species then doesn't go extinct. Um, struggle for existence is where we have, you know, the struggle or the fight over resources. Organisms have to fight for things like um, food or water or space or habitat or whatever it is. And so that's uh, one of those factors because, I mean, it kind of links back to the overproduction, right? If we have lots of babies, then there's not going to be enough room. And so we have that struggle and, and the strongest one wins. A lot of times people think of that as survival of the fittest because they think of fit being as athletic or more muscular or whatever, but survival of the fittest is our last factor. And it is actually not that it's the stronger organism, but the fact that it is just better suited to its environment. Okay. So the one when we're talking strength and, you know, brute force or smarter or whatever it is, it's going to help them get those resources. That's the struggle for existence. Survival of the fittest just means they fit their environment better. It might mean that, you know, the, the darker mouse is going to make it on that lava flow because the predators can't see it. Okay, that's survival of the fittest. It's not smarter. It's not stronger. It just has better camouflage because of its genetics. Okay, so that's um, how, how that one works. And that's the difference between struggle for existence and survival of the fittest. And there's a, a lot of times there's confusion between the two of those. So don't get those two mixed up. Um, I'm not going to go too in depth here on all of these evidences of evolution. You have this information, right? I, uh, gave it to you in your packet, but there's nine main evidences that we talked about in class. Um, I'll touch briefly on each of those. The geographic distribution, that shows us a you know, big picture how the earth has changed, right? How we have that, that one supercontinent um, like Pangaea. This has happened actually multiple times throughout history, but the one that we're most familiar with is Pangaea, where all those continents were together before they spread out. Um, and it also kind of gives us an idea of how those animals got separated during that and therefore changed based on that geographic separation. Um, morphology includes homologous structures and vestigial structures. It also includes analogous structures. That's in your packet. We didn't talk about it a whole lot, but um, you do need to be familiar with that. And I'll, I'll touch on it just in a second. Um, homologous structures is the one that is where we use the diagram of the forearm and the bones in the forearm. How um, even though your arm and hand doesn't actually look anything like a bat's wing. If we look structurally at it, you have the same basic structures and they're in the same basic locations. Okay. Um, that's homologous structures. Analogous structures is like um, the wing on a bird and the wing on a butterfly. Just because they both have wings and they have the same function doesn't mean that they're related. Okay, so homologous structures, like the forearm, that shows common ancestry. Analogous structures, just because they look the same or, or function the same, not necessarily even look the same, but they function the same, does not show common ancestry. Okay, that's the difference between those. Homologous structures, common ancestor. Analogous structures, not necessarily a common ancestor. Okay. Vestigial structures then are also part of morphology, and these are the structures that over time are reduced or removed uh, functionally, like the whale has the hip bones, right? Things like that. Whales don't even have legs. Why do we have hip bones floating around in there? Well, because those are vestigial structure, structures and because their ancestors had the legs um, and thus the need for those hips. Uh, fossil record is pretty self-explanatory. We see fossils, we get to actually see structures or, um, you know, 
I'm going to say diagrams. It's not something that something somebody drew out or anything like that. But you see this physical representation of organisms throughout history. Okay. And what that does is it kind of gives us a timeline, a picture, a picture timeline, basically, of how things have changed. Um, DNA analysis, we have capabilities of comparing DNA or comparing amino acids or comparing um, all kinds of sequences throughout um, DNA structure or, or uh, I guess, DNA sequences. And we can see how similar or how different organisms are based on that. Okay. It's literally just looking at that code and seeing those similarities or differences. Artificial selection um, is a little different. We've heard of natural selection. Um, artificial selection doesn't happen naturally. This is something that we choose. Um, and so we pick a trait, right? Natural selection is where the traits that are best fit are the ones that get passed down. In artificial selection, we choose those traits, right? Like, um, I want a puppy that fits in my hand, right? So I choose tiny, tiny dogs to breed to other tiny, tiny dogs. Or personally, I want some giant dog, right? And so I would want, you know, to find dogs that are very large in, in structure and stature. And I would breed those because I would want my puppy to grow up to be some big beastie dog, right? Um, but so artificial, we choose that. It doesn't mean that that dog is better suited to its environment, right? But we choose what we want. We select that um, ourselves instead of letting nature do that it's, um, on its own. Transitional forms, um, we use fossils for this a lot of times, right? And these are just those intermediate forms showing how the current organisms are related to their ancestors. Um, we have the current whale, right? And then we have the fossils of this ancestor of a whale that has legs and, and, and other structures like that. And we would have never known that they were related if we couldn't step that through time using those transitional forms. And so it's kind of like the missing puzzle pieces in the middle. Um, embryology is fun. This is where we look at those embryos and see how everybody looks like a fishing lure at that first embryonic stage, right? Um, and organisms with common ancestry have the same structures at those point, um, that, at that point, even though those structures may not go on and have the same functions later in development, they still have that um, at one point, which shows that common ancestry. Um, antibiotic and pesticide resistance, of course, we talked about how Bacteria are becoming resistant to antibiotics because of the overuse of those antibiotics. How, um, what happens is we take the antibiotics and we kill off all the ones that they kill, but due to mutation or whatever, um, some of those don't die. Well, guess who's alive then to reproduce? It's the bacteria that the antibiotics didn't kill. And so now we have you know, new generations of bacteria that the antibiotics can't kill. Same thing with pesticides. And, and killing the insects on our crops and things like that. It works exactly the same way. Um, we kill off the ones that can be killed, but due to genetic mutation, some of them survive, and then they have babies that are also resistant to that. And then, of course, the one which is, I would say, most applicable to what we're doing right now as, we're, as I'm teaching you from my living room, right, is viral evolution. Um, we're here because of a virus, right? Um, you get a flu shot every year or people, and you may not personally, but people get flu shots every year because those viruses evolve. Um, the coronavirus is spreading super quickly and they're having a hard time figuring it out because they found that it's already mutated and evolved, like it's changed um, a couple different times, right? Viruses have very high mutation rates and reproductive rates which means we can see that evolution occurring much more quickly than we can in other organisms, um, which is why it's so hard to fight it, right? That's why we haven't figured this one out 100% yet. And that's why I'm sitting in my recliner teaching you from my living room instead of getting to sit in class and, and you know, have conversations with you at school. So um, thanks, viruses, for changing so quickly. And 
it's really awesome that you allow us to see that evolution occur on a shorter scale or a shorter time scale. But, um, you know, it'd be really cool if you'd quit and let us figure it out so that we can all go back to class. Okay. Allele frequency. Remember, alleles are versions of a gene. Okay. Um, you need to understand the concept of allele frequency. You need to be able to give the frequency of an allele in a given generation. If I give you a data table, um, think back to where you had to color in, what was it, the, the brown and black mice? I don't remember exactly. We'll say brown and black mice, right? Genes for brown and black. Um, and, you know, you have to use your knowledge of genetics. This is where we bring these together. And if it is... Um, you know, homozygous dominant, that means you have two of the capital alleles. If it's heterozygous, you have one capital and one lowercase. And if it's homozygous recessive, then you have two lowercase. And when we're talking allele frequency, we're literally talking about how many of each allele there is. Okay. And then we'll touch a little bit more about the directional selection and stuff like that in a minute. I have a picture for that. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if that's the next slide or not, um, but we'll be talking genetic drift on that one. So just make sure you understand the basics of those. But allele frequency on its own is literally just how many of each allele do you find in that sample? Not how many pairs or anything like that. How many individuals? Yes, here we go. Um, so then genetic drift, we know there's those three main ways. I know this is a little redundant on the next slide uh, or the past slide. Sorry about that. Um, but you get the point. Um, three main ways that those genes can change. We have the, look right here, this is our original population, and then we have directional selection, which meant we went from, you know, this pretty, like we didn't have a whole lot of light mice, we didn't have a whole lot of dark mice, we had a lot that were here in the middle, and now due to some natural event, let's say the volcano erupts, which makes the ground darker, well, then the lighter ones start to stand out more and they get eaten. The darker ones start to be able to reproduce more and they pass down that darker trait. So this just shifts over um, in, a in a single direction. Or um, in this one here, let's say um, reproductive choice, right? The females are more attracted to either the really light mouse or the really dark mouse, and they didn't really have, for whatever reason, much attraction to that tan mouse in the middle. And so therefore, the tan mouse doesn't get to reproduce, and but the light one does, and the dark one does. And so then we see a peak in those genes that get passed down. Uh, or we finally have the stabilizing selection, where um, a good example is if we went through and clear cut a forest, taking out all of the nice little nooks and crevices and hiding places and shady places and things like that. And now we're down to just a, a dirt, um, like a tan, dusty environment. Well, guess who's going to do really well there? It's the tan colored mouse. The white ones stand out, so they get eaten. The dark ones stand out, so they get eaten. And so we stabilize here in the middle. Okay. Um, again, the reason that there is that overlap with, with the, the, slide on allele frequency is because we're still talking about how genetics and evolution go together here. Allele frequency, we're talking about the actual number of those alleles that we find. Genetic drift, we see how those alleles or how those genes change and the three different ways that they do that, that how they can, can vary from that original population. Um, cladograms, uh, we just went over cladograms a few days ago. Um, cladistics is just the study of those cladograms and the analysis of them. Um, but those cladograms basically are the diagrams that show the relationship between the organisms based on the traits that they have. And they show how they're related back to those common ancestors. Um, and so you just need to make sure that if I give you a group of organisms and a group of traits, um, then you can lay that out and make one of these. Or if I give you one of these, you can explain to me how those organisms are related. Like for example, on this one, everything after lampreys have um, a vertebral column and, oh no, excuse me, they only have, like everything after lampreys, from lampreys on has a vertebral column. Meaning that every organism, let me clarify that a little bit, every organism that occurs after that trait 
has that trait. Okay. So the turtle has all of the traits before it. They have the amniotic egg, they have the four walking legs, they have jaws, and they have the vertebral column. Okay. So that's just how it lays out. Um, everything before it, it has. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, then we have speciation due to some type of separation. It could be geographic separation. It could be reproductive separation. It could be because this group over here um, is, you know, more likely to reproduce during the daytime and or, or even be awake during the daytime. And this group over here, even though it may be the same species, is more likely to be nocturnal due to whatever factors. It happens a lot um, over many generations they're not going to be reproducing with each other, right? Um, because they're not awake at the same time. And so eventually, through adaptation and natural selection and things like that, it's going to get to where the, a new species has evolved. By definition, a new species is one that can't successfully mate and reproduce with the original species. Um, they cannot produce an offspring that can then produce more offspring, okay? And so by definition, then we have a new species. But it doesn't have to just be geographic. A lot of times we think of speciation occurring due to geographic isolation um, and the fact that now this group is, is um, having to adapt to certain things while this group over here is adapting to different things, giving them different traits being passed down. Well, yes, that's a great example, but it's not the only one. Okay. So keep that in mind. But by definition, because of some separation, um, these two groups of the same species will then evolve separately, eventually creating a new species. No, not overnight. It's not like, you know, we make some new animal. It's not like that. It just changes that individual species enough or group enough that it can no longer go back and successfully mate with the original species, or at least can't successfully reproduce with that orig original species. So um, anyway, so that's kind of a big, whoops, I don't know where I went. There's a big overview of evolution itself. Um, I hope that that helped you out. I hope that it made it to where you have a good basic understanding of what this exam is going to be about. Um, and I hope at least, if nothing else, it helps you to figure out what areas you may need to focus a little bit more on. As always, email me if you have any questions. Um, make notes as you go through this. Obviously, you should be taking these notes but make notes off to the side of any questions that you may have because on Friday we are doing a face-to-face -face review. Okay. Be ready for that. Come to me with questions so that that is beneficial for you because your test is the beginning of next week. Hope you all have a lovely day. And again, ask questions. Bye-bye.